have any questions, by the way. Now, the idea, I mean, uh, there are some glitches in the derivations, uh, but the main idea was that we have, I mean, we already, you already know one problem of uh, field theory, which is uh, just a simple harmonic oscillator in zero dimensions uh, with the only parameter over there is time. And you should also make these distinctions. If you look at the harmonic oscillator, we basically have two, two descriptions of the same problem. One is we have this mass that is going back and forth. It has various excitation energies. And there's just a single mass. No creation of any other masses. Or the other description is in terms of these energy packages, which if you apply this principle to a solid state, they are called phonons. If you apply this to uh, electromagnetism, they are called photons. You can apply the same thing to Higgs boson. In that case, it's a boson, etc. In that case, we have a, the creation and annihilation of various particles in my system. But at the end of the day, it is exactly the same thing. And then what we did is we started with this single harmonic oscillator and uh, then said that, okay, we might have many of them, not just one. And then we also have this annihilation and creation operators at every point. Uh, <coughs> and in your, one of your uh, homeworks for uh, next week was just to actually construct this system of harmonic oscillators. You have uh, just masses attached to each other by springs. And then each one of them are attached by some uh, rod or massless string by to the walls. You see, what you will discover is that this is what would be uh, creating a term that we will call the mass term for the field. Now we will, we will see it in more detail later on why we call it the mass term. Then you will construct it, but still here, for example, you had these masses that are moving back and forth. Now the, all of this exercise, uh, no, uh, before going that, also just make this distinction. There is, we have these operators, a, a dagger, their commentator was, if we have a single oscillator, it's just one. If we have many oscillators, then we call it the Kronecker delta ij, because if i and j basically correspond to different oscillators, their operators just commute with each other. And then we took the continuum limit, phi x, phi dagger y, this is uh, just Kronecker delta x minus y in one dimension. And then in one of your other homeworks, we also said that show that a, a dagger, a commutator with any operator, any function of a dagger, is actually derivative of f. And well, there is already one thing that you are familiar with, the commutator of x and p is i, and you already know that p is, you write p as h, h bar is 1, it's just a minus i del over del x. Now, this is what we call a realization. of the operator P. Let me put a hat over there. You see, the operator P exists, and it has this property. And this is what we call quantization. Just imposing this property is what we call the quantization. And for example, when we were discussing the harmonic oscillator example last week, the only thing we used was this commutator and nothing else. I didn't use, the, I didn't use a re realization or a representation of P as the derivative operator. It doesn't have to be. And all the properties of this momentum operator should be, you should be able to drive them using this property. In fact, this condition 
tells me that one possible realization of the momentum operator is just this derivative operator. And similarly over here, one possible realization of A is again the derivative operator. Well, another thing you have to keep in mind is, uh, for example, here you can write derivative of a function. This just doesn't exist. You see, you cannot take the derivative with respect to an operator. Just like you cannot take the derivative with respect to a vector. The position operator is just one. You say, what do you call, the, uh, what do you mean by a uh, derivation? You just take, evaluate the function at two different values. Well, if the values are operator and if you have only one operator, well, you cannot take the, evaluate the function at two different operators. So it just doesn't make sense to take, talk about the derivative with respect to an operator. But what we will be, we will still be talking about about the uh, uh, derivative with respect to operators like this one over here. You see, uh, on purpose I didn't write this as a derivative with respect to a dagger. Sometimes I will still write it down. I will write the f a dagger divided by the a dagger. As I said, this doesn't really have any meaning. The actual meaning of this one is derivative of f, whatever argument you put inside, let's say uh, y, derivative with respect to y, you take this derivative and then evaluate this function at y is equal to a dagger. That is what's the meaning when I write a derivative with respect to an operator. Mm -hmm. Now, for the same holds for x. x is an operator, there is a single x operator. Mm -hmm. Momentum is an operator, there is a single momentum operator. I don't have many momentum operators. But the eigenvalues of these functions are, in general, continuous. So I can take the derivative with respect to the eigenvalues, if you like. But I cannot take the derivative with respect to operators. So in one of your homeworks, you were required to show that uh, a, a dagger, this, well, you were required to show this one. I mean, you are not allowed to go from a to x and p and write p as the momentum operator because that is just one realization in a particular system. So the main exercise of last week, <laughs> including this uh, homework example, is that there, is a, there are some certain operators whose realizations are, uh, no, okay. there are certain realizations of operators that satisfy the, these commutation relations. We can actually realize them, actually construct them as the derivatives and the positions of certain system. But we don't have to do that. Since there is a realization, we know that these operators exist. And then we will, so since we know that they exist, we can define them, we can actually find a concrete realization in a particular system, well, we can just use them in any system that you like. Now, this abstraction also brings another thing. We will be talking about fields, although we came to the idea of fields by using these strings that are just vibrating the waves on a string. We don't need to have even strings. The idea is we can define operators, phi of x, phi dagger of y, of position, such that their commutators satisfy this relation. That's the only thing we have. Now, then we can say that just like in the case of the annihilation and creation operator or photons in an oscillator, well, we can think of these as in two different, uh, we can have two different viewpoints. One is we have these creation of an annihilation of particles or the other description is there is this field, this abstract notion. It's not a field in real space. Not, I mean, in the case of the harmonic oscillator, the oscillator was oscillating in real space. But they don't, it doesn't have to oscillate in real space. 
is some kind of an abstract functional space. There is this field which kind of fills the universe, if you like, and its excitations are what we call particles. So we have now these two different descriptions of the same thing. Either there is a single field filling all of the universe, which can be excited, de-excited, or we can have particles which can be created or annihilated. They will be the same description, describing the same thing. For example, we will eventually be dealing with electrons, one of the particles we will be dealing with. You can say that there are millions of millions of electrons in the universe. That is one description. An equivalent description is there is an electron field, a single one, filling all of the universe, and it has such and such an excitation state. Now, there are all these discussions also about whether the fundamental objects are particles or the fields themselves. Some people claim that we should, the more, more fundamental, and we will have a more fundamental understanding if we stick with the field description rather than the particle description. I mean, like, Onro. Uh, But the problem is we don't have any detectors that can detect the fields. We have detectors that can detect the particles. So how can we detect the fields? Any questions? Well, let's, let's look at this one. Uh, you have the harmonic oscillator. Do you see the oscillator going back and forth? Hmm? Yeah, you, you can see that. Right? But you can also detect the energy going into the oscillator or coming out of the oscillator. Those are your energy packages. Okay, so we can detect the electrons, for example. We can create electron-positron pairs. So that is essentially the energy that goes into the electron field. But we are not detecting what is oscillating. We are just detecting the energy packages. Okay, so... Uh, now, the last, in the last, at the end of the last lecture, we had somewhat arrived, and there were certain glitches in our derivation, but eventually we came to, let's say, the Lagrangian, which we wrote as dx. Well, there, was some, there were some kind of fields we had. Uh, there was the time derivative of the field minus the uh, position derivative of the field. It was a one-dimensional problem. So we only had del phi by del x, squared, I will say c is equal to 1 from now on also. And, uh, well, if you go to the three dimensions, all dimensions should be equal. If there is an x derivative, you should get a y or the z derivatives. So actually, this should be replaced by the gradient. You see, we have already started using some of the symmetries of the universe. Now I have used the rotational symmetry. If there is a derivative with respect to x, the second derivative with respect to x, I have to have the second derivative with respect to y, and the z with equal coefficients. If there is no symmetry, their coefficients need not be the same, their order need not be the same, etc. And now we have minus m squared phi squared. This was the Lagrangian we had. And, uh, well, just like whatever you do in classical mechanics, you can also do it over here. We can define the momentum. Uh, there will be certain changes. You see, if, you have the, if we had a discrete system, we could write this Lagrangian as some kind of a phi i, phi j, with certain coefficients. This is what we would have. That would, uh, let's say the, The first term will be uh, phi i dot squared, 
then we would have minus m squared phi i squared, and then we would have some uh, phi i phi j terms, <coughs> which will relate to these gradients. Now, how do we get the momentum corresponding to a given coordinate? Well, just take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of that coordinate. In this particular example, we, that would just give us phi i dot. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry, in the second Lagrangian, <coughs> the, the, the third term does not co correspond to the gradient. How does it correspond to the gradient? There is no derivative, right? This one. Well, I mean, uh, let's say the actually the, we will have i i plus 1 and phi i phi i plus 1 you can relate this to phi i plus 1 minus phi i squared. And this in the continuum limit just becomes the derivative of phi. That's how the correspondence is. And then we said that, okay, that term is actually is the term that is responsible for the motion of the particles in space. So this is what we did. Well, we can do a similar thing over here. Uh, now, uh, by the way, to obtain this derivative, this uh, result, there are a couple of things we use. One thing we use was the derivative of. We said that the derivative of phi i dot with respect to phi j dot. These are just various variables we can want to first, second, third to coordinate, and this was just Kronecker delta i j. Now, when we go to the continuum limit, this needs to be modified a bit. You see, now we have the phi dot at the, the field, the time derivative of the field at a given point, and another time derivative of the field at a different point. We have such derivatives. And I will, we will also change the symbol slightly. These, will, these are what's, what are called functional derivatives. So this should become the Kronecker delta x minus y in the continuum. Limit. Well, not Dirac delta. You see, Kronecker delta is a sensible quantity for discrete, very discrete uh, indices. It doesn't make sense for continuous indices. But the Dirac delta makes sense for the continuous indices. Why the Dirac delta? Why that coefficient? Basically because of this reason. Sum over i this sum should be 1. The analogous expression in the continuum limit will be the integral over whatever coordinates you have of Dirac delta phi dot the, this functional derivative should be 1. This relation we still would like to have. Well, we can even generalize to three dimensions now. The idea would be, well, if this is a three-dimensional, then this is a three-dimensional integral. And th that three-dimensional integral should be 1. So this derivative should be actually the three-dimensional Dirac delta if x, y, x and y are three-dimensional vectors. So th if this is our Lagrangian, Then the momentum at the point, let's say y, uh, let's just move to three dimensions. This will be the derivative, functional derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot at the point y. This is the q dx. And uh, well, only the first term has a phi dot dependence. If you take the, well, the functional derivative just looks like the real derivative, so it's the square, the derivative of a square, so it is twice the function itself times the derivative of the function. <coughs> this is a Dirac delta. 
So the momentum, uh, sorry, we had this one or two. Well, it doesn't really make it too much of a difference whether you have a one over two, but the convention is just to have that one over two. So the momentum uh, at the point y is now, uh, here there is a one over two, which cancels this two. It's just phi dot at y. You can derive the equation of motion satisfied by this phi. In the discrete case, the equation of motion was uh, del by del t of the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot minus the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to uh, phi equals zero. The continuum limit, well, the form is identical, but you just replace the normal derivatives with functional derivatives. Well, we had already evaluated this one. Well, let me use the y. Well, let me just write the terms in, the, in our Lagrangian that depends only on phi. Well, it's just the last two terms. This should be zero. Any questions? Then I have a question for you. Well, you see, here I, I claim that I, I wrote only the terms in the Lagrangian that depend on phi. So I ignored the time derivative of phi. But I'm still keeping the position derivative of phi. Why? Before, when I was taking the time derivative, okay, so forget, okay, so let's, let's stick with this one. You see my point? You see, when I was taking the, the, here there is the time derivative, and the time derivative only takes the uh, derivative of the first term in our Lagrangian, this one. Then I'm taking the derivative of my Lagrangian with respect to phi, but then I claim that, okay, this term, the gradient of phi term, and this phi squared term, they both depend on phi, so I should take the derivative of both of them. So why do I ignore the phi that term? Uh, if I'm ignoring the phi that term, if I'm claiming that phi that is independent of phi, so its derivative is zero, why do I keep the position derivative? Uh, there is an integral over uh, volume, and we can do integration by Okay, that is what I will do eventually, but that doesn't that will not show me that it is but zero. When I uh, do integration by parts, the phi is uh, live along in the integral. So, can I, so I can do a variation over this along phi. So, and I get a, a, a Laplace sin of a, a phi. So. If I you don't say, do this, <coughs> I ignore this term. Hmm? If I don't do this, I ignore the term uh, Laplace of a phi in the uh, equation of uh, motion. You see, you cannot determine your strategy based on the result that you want to get. You first determine your principles, and whatever those principles leads you to, well, that's your result.
if the result doesn't make sense, it only means that your principles just do not make sense. Well, you see, the answer is actually over here. You see, what you do in classical physics, you treat the time derivative, the coordinates, and their uh, generalized velocity as independent. You have the right to do that. And then just drive all your uh, conclusions. But you see here, the position derivative is actually my generalized coordinates, some combination of them. They are not independent of my generalized coordinates, but my time derivative is my time derivative, nothing to do about that. So that is why uh, I, I keep the, when I'm taking the derivative with respect to phi, I keep the gradient term, this term, and I should take this derivative because it is actually this term, it's just a product of the coordinates. Okay, you see. Let's, let's stick with this term, this expression. Yeah. Okay. Now, what is the derivative of this thing with respect to phi j? Hmm? Well, this is the derivative with respect to phi j of minus m squared phi i squared minus sum over i j phi i phi i plus 1, whatever the result gives me. Okay. So, but this is what eventually leads to the gradient of phi squared. I should be doing, I, I'm essentially doing whatever we are doing in the, con in the discrete limit, I'm doing exactly the same thing in the continuum limit. I'm not changing anything except I'm taking certain limits. That's why I would like, I rather keep in mind the discrete limit uh, at one side of my mind. So whenever you are in top, I'll go to the discrete limit. The discrete limit is just a classical Lagrangian. Uh, I mean, uh, the discrete limit is what you are already familiar with. The only difference is you have not just one or two uh, generalized coordinates, you have many generalized coordinates. So now let's take the derivative. And when we are actually taking this derivative over here, we will be doing what your friend has proposed. We will do some integration by parts. Well, the equation of motion is zero is equal to phi dot y. <coughs> phi double dot y minus d cubed x. Let's start with the first term, minus 1 over 2. Well, it's a function squared, so its derivative is twice the function itself multiplied by the derivative of the function. And then the derivative of the second term will just give me minus 1 over 2 m squared phi of x, derivative of phi of x with respect to phi of y. And uh, let's continue. This is the first term. Th this derivative over here is just a Dirac delta. So I just give me, there's a factor 2 over here. It cancels this 1 over 2. I have plus m squared phi of y. plus, well, this two cancels this two, I have d cubed x, gradient of phi. Well, you see, the gradient just tells me to take the differences of two generalized coordinates, just here, this gradient. It takes me to take the difference of two generalized coordinates. The derivative is with respect to the generalized coordinate itself. So I can take the difference and take the derivative with respect to generalized coordinates, or first take the derivative with respect to generalized coordinates of each one of these terms in the difference and take their difference. So a difference and derivative will be, we will be able to exchange them. 
So I can just write the, gra the gradient of derivative of phi of x with respect to phi of y. So is it clear or complicated? You see, the idea is this one. This gradient of phi <coughs> this term, okay, I'm ignoring certain factors and the limits. This is actually phi i plus 1 minus phi i. It's derivative with respect to phi j. That is what that term is in the discrete limit. Well, this is actually derivative of phi i plus 1 with respect to phi j minus derivative of phi i with respect to phi j in the continuum limit. As I said, I'm just ignoring certain factors, etc. But this is nothing but, you see, in the continuum limit, this term is derivative of phi. Uh, let's say i is x, j is y. And then this difference just tells me it's the gradient. This is the continuum limit of that expression. So you see what I did. In the first line over here, I first take the differences of coordinates and then take their derivative with respect to another coordinate. Here, I am first taking the derivative of the each coordinate in the difference with respect to this coordinate, and then take, take their difference. But that is just the gradient of the derivative. So here we have the Dirac delta. Uh, this is x. I can take the do an integration by part. The Dirac delta at the infinity bound at the boundary at infinity will be zero, so no contributions from the boundary, and so this will just give me zero is equal to phi double dot of y uh, plus m squared phi of y minus the uh, divergence of the gradient is just Laplacian of phi at the point y. So zero is the second derivative minus the Laplacian acting on phi plus m squared phi. Uh, this uh, operator over here, uh, you might be already familiar in electromagnetism or in a relativistic physics course. This is what we call the Lambert sheet. <coughs> and this is what we call the Klein Gordon equation. Now, the, uh, one, the idea of the Klein-Gordon equation it was actually, you see, how one way of, in quotes, deriving the Schrodinger equation. Well, you write the Hamiltonian, or the energy of the system, p squared over 2m plus v. In this form, there are operators. And now you say, OK, let me just uh, act on this on our Hilbert space. And let us look at this, this, um, these matrix elements. So if I have a state, the amplitude for it to be at the point R at the time T is actually this one. Now, this matrix element, you can write the momentum operator. Uh, you can take the momentum operator out of that matrix element by writing it as the derivative.
Now you see here, r is the operator, it's not a number. Here, r is a number, a vector. Here, the momentum operator is not the derivative. But if I take it out of this matrix element, it just acts like a derivative. It acts as a derivative on the matrix element. <coughs> so this is how we derive it. Now, of course, this expression over here is not relativistic. This is valid only for particles that are moving slowly, slow compared to the speed of light. The relativistic version would be E squared is equal to P squared plus M squared, assuming there is no potential. And just another reminder, I'm using units in which H bar is 1, C is 1. If you do the same thing over here, well now you be quantized well, here. The steps we had was, okay, here these are operators, operators that satisfy P, I, X, J is equal to minus I Kronecker delta I, J. And then you define this R and T states to be eigenstates of these operators. And then you can write this one. Well, basically, we do the same. We can do the same thing over here. This is the uh, energy expression. Then we have the we uh, quantize it by saying that p i x i x j, saying that they are operators, is equal to uh, minus i Kronecker dot i j. You can drive a corresponding equation for this operator identity and it just gives us that minus del squared by del t squared psi uh, is equal to minus the great Laplacian of psi plus m squared psi. Or this just becomes del squared by del t squared minus the Laplacian plus m squared acting on psi is equal to zero. This is nothing but our klein gordon equation. You can say that the klein gordon equation is a generalized equation. It's a generalization of the relativistic version of the free particle, free Schrodinger equation. Of course, there's a, still one problem over here which we will address eventually, not now. Uh, but you see, the Schrodinger equation is a time-independent equation. is a first order in, is an equation first order in time. So it basically tells us that if I know the wave function now, I know the wave function at every time. <coughs> I just need one initial condition in time. But klein gordon equation is a second order differential equation, which basically tells me that just knowing the wave function now is not enough. I should also know the time derivative of the wave function now so that I can determine uh, all the uh, future and the past of my wave function. But then there is a problem. On one hand, in the non-relativistic limit, the wave function now is enough. In the relativistic ver version, the wave function now is not enough. Can't we just find another equation which will just uh, be first order in time? And that is what Dirac did. I don't think it's Dirac equation. But I mean, my idea is first let's get some grasp of what the field theory is, what we do with field theory. And then we will see what kind of particle we can describe using the field theory. So that's uh, okay. So now we started with getting some idea of what field theory is. Here we are driving the equation of motion of. Now up at this point, what I have done is everything is classical. Now then the question is, uh, how do we quantize them? Well, the recipe is already there. You see the quantization recipe. Ixj, this is equal to uh, minus i Kronecker dot ij. This was in the case of uh, quantum mechanics with a few degrees of freedom. And now we <coughs> here we have many degrees of freedom. 
but continuous degrees of freedom, in fact, the quantization condition is just pi of x, uh, phi of y is equal to uh, minus i the three-dimensional Dirac delta x minus y. Well, let me write it slightly in a slightly different form. Energy is a time derivative. Energy squared is the second time derivative. Momentum is the gradient. Momentum squared is Laplacian. M is just M. That's what I did. So I just re e, e operator, I just replaced it with a I del by del T. And the momentum operator. I just replaced it with uh, minus i, the gradient. Well, um, we, in the last expression, we took uh, uh, the energy fixed time, t0. But in general, do we not have to take it like an arbitrary time at a four dimension direct? Now, we will derive it later on. Now, before going asking you what the time is in the in that uh, field theory version. Let me ask you, what is the time over here? Just quantum mechanics. At what time? Okay. Well, depends. You see, in quantum mechanics, have you you <coughs> Uh, seen ver these various pictures in quantum mechanics. So now let's let's go over the various pictures in quantum mechanics. We have the Schrödinger picture. Now, what Schrödinger picture tells us is that if I know the wave function, let's say at some time t is equal to t zero. I can evaluate the wave function at the time t by just using the time evolution operator, which is e to the power minus i h t minus t zero. h is the Hamiltonian of my system. And then my operators p and x, these are time independent. So in that sense, here, I put the value uh, t0 and t0 over there, but actually they are time independent. But then you, will com you should complain. What do you mean they are time independent? We already wrote about the momentum is the time derivative. So that's why I prefer to keep the time index. Now let's see. Let's let's go back over here. Uh, you see, uh, the time. That, yeah, uh, if you remember when we were discussing about the Lagrangian, or the uh, how we derive the momentum, we we just take the derivative with respect to the time derivative and treat the, the generalized velocity in, as independent of generalized coordinate. So in that sense, the generalized co velocities are not really the time derivatives of the coordinates. They are just independent objects, which eventually turn out to be time derivatives. But eventually, to start with, we just treat them as independent. 
So that's essentially the same idea over here. The phi dot over there we, that we wrote in writing down the momentum no, is not really the time derivative at this stage. So probably it's getting even more confusing now. So let's continue with these various pictures. So I, we have the Schrodinger picture. That is, the wave functions are time dependent, whereas the operators are time independent. And there is the Heisenberg picture. <coughs> well, the idea behind the Heisenberg picture is, well, we don't observe these states. What we actually observe are just uh, certain matrix elements of certain operators. So let's say we have an operator O, I observe this psi of t and phi of t. I can have the overlap of two wave functions, the matrix element of this operator O between two different states at a given time. This is what I'm interested in. This is what we actually observe. But this is the same thing as phi at t is equal to t0, e to power i h t minus t0, o e to power minus i h t minus t0, psi at t, minus t, uh, t is equal to t0. Now Schrodinger picture just corresponds to a defining these things as time-dependent objects and define, defines O as time-independent. But I don't have to do that. I can just equally <coughs> define these objects as my time dependent quantity and the bras and the cats they are just evaluated t is equal to t0 independent. So we have now, in the case of the, in the Schrodinger picture, the uh, wave function is time dependent and its time dependence is given by the Schrodinger equation. This is the Schrodinger equation. Well, in the case of the Heisenberg picture, the cats are time independent. There's no time evolution there. But what is time-dependent are the operators. <laughs> and I can take the time derivative. of the operators now, I will assume that the Hamiltonian is time independent, etc. So this just becomes uh, h i h e to power i h t minus t zero o e to power minus i h t minus t zero and uh, plus e to power i h t minus t zero o e to power minus i h t minus t zero uh, minus i h, but this is i times h or Heisenberg minus the operator in the Heisenberg picture at the time t times h, or derivative of any operator time derivative of any operator with respect to the Heisenberg in the Heisenberg picture is just their com its commutator with the Hamiltonian. You see, last week when we were we were calculating the time derivatives and we were actually using this this uh, 
connotation relation. Now, the transition between the uh, Heisenberg picture and the, okay, you see, this is the definition. So the operator, Heisenberg picture operator evaluate at some reference time is actually equal to the operator in the Schrodinger picture. So using this, you can just go back and forth. T0 is some arbitrary reference time. It doesn't really, it's just like your initial condition in the wave, wave function. <coughs> so let's go back to this commentators. Now, uh, I'm sure you have done the exercises for a given potential. You have calculated the uh, commutation between the p and x at different times, then it's no longer the Kronecker delta. You see, pi of t in the, uh, now this is the Heisenberg picture operators, xj in the Heisenberg picture operator that at a different time t prime. <coughs> in general, this is not proportional to Kronecker delta ij. Do you remember? Have you seen examples of this? Well, just as a simple example, let's do the harmonic oscillator. We have the R H P squared over 2M plus 1 over 2M H squared. Let's say these are the operators. If you go ahead and calculate the time derivative of p, you will find that this is just uh, minus mx, and x dot is just p over m. Well, let me just drop the hats. These are the time derivatives of these operators. Well, we can solve them. Let's see. Uh, x will be x of t, or let me write it this way. <coughs> From here, we know that x double dot is just minus x. And here there's an omega squared minus omega squared x. So this tells me that x of t is actually uh, x0 cosine omega t. I'm just take, choosing my reference point at zero, plus some unknown thing for the time being, sine omega t. And p dot, uh, p, which is mx dot, which is m times x zero omega sine omega t, plus m omega a cosine omega t, so at t equal to 0, p0 zero is equal to m omega a, or a is p0 over m omega. And so I know what x of t is. This is x0 cosine omega t plus p0 over m omega sine omega t. And p of t is minus m omega, here there's a minus sign x0 sine omega t uh, plus p0 cosine omega t. Now I can write there commutator p of t, x of t at an arbitrary time, t prime let me say, at two different times. Let's see what it will be. This will be p0 cosine omega t minus m omega x0 sine omega t. x0 cosine omega t plus p0 over m omega sine omega t. Which will be... Well, the terms in the second... Um the comma with the two primes. Yes. Well, P0x0 commutator 
cosine omega t cosine omega t prime and uh, minus x0 p0 commutator sine omega t sine omega t prime Well, this commutator is uh, minus i, and this commutator here is just i, so this is equal to minus i cosine omega t, t minus t prime. In fact, you can even look at this one, x of t, x of t prime. You see, if t is equal to t prime, this should be 0. Well, let's calculate it. x of t is this one over here. Well, this will be x0 x0 p0 sine omega t prime over m omega plus uh, times cosine omega t plus p0 x0 sine omega t cosine omega t prime over m omega. And if you put in all the numbers, etc., this is i over m omega sine of omega t prime minus t. You see, it's no longer 0 if t and t prime are different. So these time dependent, this uh, different time commutation relations will be and can be, can be and will be different than the equal time commutation relation. So this is what we have over here. This is the equal time commutation relationships. <coughs> if they are at different times, it will no longer be a Dirac delta. But you can also understand it from a different perspective. You see, I mean, you can just treat the, these operators change your system. They act on your state. They, they have some kind of a physical interpretation. And the commutators, uh, in a sense, will be a major of whether they can be uh, these objects can influence each other or not. You see, for example, p and x, they do not commute. It basically tells me that I just cannot determine the momentum and the coordinate of an object uh, at the same time. Well, these fields, they have similar interpretations. I mean, if you look at the, the let's, let's say, the harmonic oscillator realization of these uh, operators, well, one of them will be the momentum of this oscillator over here. The other one will be the uh, displacement of this oscillator over here. If the, I'm talking about different oscillators, well, then I can determine their uh, position and momentum at the same time. So the, this commutation relation should be zero at the same time because they cannot influence each other at the same time. But if I first determine the momentum of this one and wait for some time, well, it will affect the position of the other one eventually. So if these commutators at different times need not be zero if they, are, if they are not evaluated at the same point. At the same time, they have to be zero. In fact, we will have even more, one more constraint on these. The commutators of fields, whatever fields we have, it should be zero if uh, those space-time points are separated by a space-like separation. 
That will be one constraint we will e eventually impose on our system. They have to be zero. Otherwise, uh, we have faster than speed travel of information, etc. Next question. Uh, so you calculate the XP commutator like that, uh, but in uh, different times we have also uh, non-zero commutator. Okay. Uh, this uh, have a physical meaning. What do you mean? Uh, no, you see, you, you see, here, uh, <coughs> this one. It just tells me that the momentum measurement at a given time t can influence the position measurement at a given time t prime, and vice versa. That's basically what these commutators tell me. No, this is not a transition amplitude yet. Eventually, we will be interested in transition amplitudes, but the transition amplitudes, we are interested in the transition amplitudes between states. So here I'm not specifying any state. There are no states yet. But if I uh, choose a state? Yes, if I choose a state, then this commutation relation essentially tells me that if you choose a state and measure the momentum at a given, you see, if you choose a state, if you measure the momentum first and the uh, coordinate next, or if you do the measurement in the other way around, uh, the commutator being non-zero uh, tells me that the, the results will be different. Now, this commutator, this first one, well, in fact, even this field generalization of this, you see over here, what this tells me is if I measure my field over here and my momentum over here at different times, if I change their order, the outcome might be different if they are, I don't do this measurement at the same time, at the same point. If I do these measurements at the same time, then whether I measure one thing over here first and the other one over here second, or the other way around, doesn't change anything. That's what these computations will tell me. And uh, of course, if I don't make these measurements at the same time, then one measurement over here and another measurement over here, it will uh, change which one I do first. The outcome will be different. Now, any questions up to here? You see, the, the main thing over here is when we are quantizing these fields in a more formal way, we will eventually be imposing this constraint. And so now, let's do what we had already done in the case of the oscill harmonic oscillators. You see, these fields phi, we know that they satisfy this relationship, this equation. This is the condition we have. Furthermore, I will still treat this phi to be real. Well, I can write down the solution right away. You see, I can write a Fourier transform of phi. Let's say I'm doing a four-dimensional uh, analysis. Well, this will be d4k, the four-dimensional momentum, divided by 2 pi to the 4. Then I have phi of k. And e to the power rkx. Minus rkx. Well, if I put this solution into my differential equation, 
what I will see is d4k divided by 2 pi to the 4, phi of k minus k squared plus m squared, this should be equal to 0. times e to the power minus i k x, this should be equal to 0. Well, this tells me that phi of k times m squared minus k squared, this should be equal to 0, which tells me that phi of k should be equal to 0 if k squared is not equal to m squared. It can have some different value if k squared is equal to m squared, but if k squared is not equal to m squared, it should definitely be 0. Well, the solution of this is phi of k me, let me just write in this way, the k vector this time, this three vector, times a Dirac delta of k squared minus m squared. Let me also add a factor of 2 pi, just for convention. Because Dirac delta of x times x, this is always 0. So this non-zero solution solves my equation. Well, so now I know my field. D4k divided by 2 pi to the 4. Phi of k, this is a three-dimensional k vector. And I have a 2 pi direct delta of k squared minus m squared. Oh, sorry, this is k. e to the power minus i k of x. And keep in mind this, what I mean k of x is k0 x0 minus k dot x. I'm already in four-dimensional space, so I'm using four-dimensional uh, vector notation. Well, I, there is a Dirac delta over there. I can integrate it over that Dirac delta. Uh, let me... Okay, let me also introduce this k0. Let me keep the k0 over there also, explicitly. Now, this Dirac delta, uh, I will integrate over k0. So I can write this Dirac delta as you know, one property of the Dirac delta is Dirac delta of f of x is always equal to Dirac delta of x minus x0 divided by the derivative at the value of x0 summed over all poss possible values of x0 such that f of x0 is equal to 0. And th this is the absolute value. So Dirac delta is non-zero at only at the values which make its argument 0. So that is why I have to find all points at which f of x is 0. And then to any integral of this Dirac delta, there will be a contribution from all, solu all solutions of this equation over here. And their contribution will be this one. So I can use that, that uh, result to simplify this Dirac delta. You see, this Dirac delta is Dirac delta k0 squared. Let me just write e of k squared, where I now define e of k is equal to square root of k squared plus m squared. You see, this m parameter was the m parameter appearing in the Klein-Gordon equation. Now, if I identify that k as the momentum and e as the energy, that m over there that appears in my Klein-Gordon equation is actually the mass of the particle. So this Dirac delta now is Dirac delta. <coughs> Either k0 is equal to e of k divided by twice e of k. Or k0 is equal to minus e of k.
And keep in mind, whatever I call E of k is a positive number. E of k is positive. k0 can be both positive or negative, but E of k by definition is positive. That's how I define it. So now I have the phi of x is, well, this 2 pi cancels one of these 2 pi's. d cubed k, I'm integrating over, I already evaluated the k0 integral, divided by 2 pi cubed. Then I have 1 over twice e of k. And then I have phi of uh, e of k, k e to the power minus i uh, e of k x0 minus k dot x and plus phi of minus e of k e to the power minus plus i e of k x0 plus k dot x. Well, in the second term, in the second integral, I will make a change of variables also. So I will just set k to minus k, just renaming the variable, so that the exponents will look similar. This is d cubed k over 2 pi cubed, uh, 1 over 2 e of k. Uh, yes. <coughs> phi of e of k, k, e to the power minus i uh, e of k, x0, minus k dot x plus phi of e of k minus k e to the power plus i e of k x0 minus k at x. This is phi of x. Now, I also know that at least if I assume that phi is a real field, uh, for the time being I will assume phi is real, well, if you take the dagger, this exponent in the first term just becomes this exponent in the second term. So if this condition is to be satisfied, then I need to have phi of e of k, k, dagger, let me put the dagger for the time being. This should be equal to phi of minus e k minus k. So if you like, in the second term, I can just use that identity. So this whole thing is actually phi of e of k, k dagger. Now, since e of k is already determined by k itself, just uh, for simplicity, I will just write this as <coughs> d cubed k divided by 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 ek, phi of k, e to the power minus i k x, plus phi dagger of k, e to the power i k x. And in the, in the last expression, k of x is actually e k, of x0 minus k dot x, where e k we had defined as the square root of k0 
squared plus m squared. Questions up to here. dimensional direct delta. You see, this is just a number. So what this equation tells me is that my function phi should be zero if that number is not a vector, if that number is non-zero. If that number is zero, then my wave function can have a different value. So this k squared minus m squared is just a number and hence the direct delta is one dimensional. The argument of that Dirac delta is not the uh, argument of a four vector. And also don't get confused that I'm using phi of x and phi of k. They are different functions. Well, since they correspond to the same field, I prefer to use the same symbol for them. But uh, just keep in mind that they are different things. Now the next step we will do is, well, okay, so this is phi. So we have to calculate pi of x, what is the corresponding momentum. And what are the commutation relations of these phi of k and phi dagger of k. And to determine them, we will be using the equal time commutation relation. <clears throat> but let's give a break now. <laughs> 